everyone. Welcome, uh, welcome back together. Uh, let's see, there we go. All right, so uh, I just want to review a little bit what the big ideas of last week were that I am hoping folks uh, took away. And if you didn't take them away, we'll just review them all over again. Uh, <laughs> because I feel like there was so much new and so much different. Uh, last week. And part of that has to do with the fact that this is just not a period of Jewish history that we study. This is also not a period of world history that we study. Right? Even if you know almost nothing about the Jewish history of the Roman era, you end up having a significant Roman education just by going through the American school system and university system and cultural. So, right? it, we, we hear a lot about ancient Rome. And so we have these ways that we can connect our history to, to pieces that we already understand. That's a lot less true of the Neo-Persian Empire, uh, which we just tend not to know much about at all. Uh, so big picture, backing away. We're talking about the 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century or so, maybe even to the 6th century uh, of the Common Era, our side of zero. Uh, and we're talking about really in the broadest of senses, the shift of Judaism and Jewish identity and simply Jews from being in Judea and its surrounding areas, the, the Roman province of Judea, uh, uh, inclusive sort of in the most expansive sense of things like the Galilee and so on and so forth, uh, to Jewish civilization being centered in Babylon which is really what happens. And Babylon is the Jewish name that we have for this area, by the way. Uh, you know, they weren't calling themselves Babylonians at the time. Uh, it's this ancient place that we have this relationship to, Bavel. And so we continue to refer to this region as Bavel. Well, so? we're dealing with the Persian Empire at the time. Uh, there was the, right in the various empires have different names, the Sassanid Empire that we talked about last year, last week. And, uh, and there are various names that are given to this whole collection. Uh, historians today call it the Neo-Persian Empire, as in the second great Persian Empire. But the big thing we should understand about this, and this will help root it with something we, we hopefully know a little more about, is that this is the Persian Empire that is Rome's primary geopolitical foil during this era. During all of these centuries, as the Roman Empire becomes two different empires and the Byzantine Empire in the East, uh, it is this Persian Empire that is the foil to Rome and that is constantly going to war with Rome. Uh, I, it struck me this week, I saw a map of Iran, contemporary Iran, and Iranian spheres of influence. And it was just wild looking at that and comparing it how similar it really is to when you look at the Neo-Persian Empire. Uh, that, that we are talking about a region that is not dissimilar today from the way it was during the Neo-Persian Empire, which is not that different from what the Persian Empire that we looked at, the Esther story era, the Babylonian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, right? There, there continues to be this sort of great northern empire uh, that is separate from the Mediterranean Empire that exists uh, and that is sort of the other side of Israel's geopolitical reality. Okay, did that make sense? Sort of the big picture of what's happening there. Now, because Jews are a minority in both of these places, uh, they play, we play an important role within both societies and communicating across these boundaries. Uh, and again, this is not that dissimilar from when we were dealing with the various Greek empires that were in the region and, and Jews were on both sides or flopping back and forth. Uh, but the Roman Empire, particularly as it becomes more Christian, becomes overtly anti-Jewish. Uh, actually, that's not fair to say. Let me take that back. Uh, because I think the Roman Empire was already pretty anti-Judean uh, before it even became Christian. Uh, it, it is the Jews who, since we are at the boundaries of empire, were constantly rebelling against Rome. And from the Roman perspective, constantly having to quash all of these uprisings that are coming from Israel, all of these various wars uh, from within its own empire. And we're a substantial, 
enough population, something like 10 to 15% of the Roman Empire during this time period, that we really are a problem for them. Uh, now, as these destructions happen, the destruction of the temple in 68, the Jewish rebellion throughout the empire around the year 100, the Bar Kokhba rebellion in the 130s, uh, all of these and the ensuing Roman destructions of Jewish civilization, Judean civilization, increase the importance of Babylonian Jewry and increase the population of Babylonian Jewry. People are leaving and people are fleeing. And each of these moments increases that flow. So it's not just that civilization, Jewish civilization is destroyed around Jerusalem. It's that a whole bunch of those people flee to Babylon, to Persia. It's not just that there are uprisings throughout the Roman Empire of Jewish communities that is quashed brutally by Rome. It's that the people that survived are getting out of Dodge and heading to Babylon where things are better. We're also a large enough population in the empire that it makes sense for Persians to try to get on our good side. Uh, and in fact, during one of these wars between Persia and Rome, there's something like 30 or 40,000 Jewish militia members, I guess, or soldiers or whatever the word is, who fight uh, for the Persians from within Roman occupied by that time it had been renamed Palestine, but but Israel, Judea. Uh, and that's exactly that dynamic there. Does that make sense? Geopolitically, do we have a little more of that context? Yeah. Uh, okay. Our literature, whether we are talking sacred literature or political literature, is also shifting towards Babylon. And that's, again, a result of all of these factors. The thriving Judeans, relatively speaking, uh, in Babylon, the destruction of the Jewish civilization around Jerusalem, uh, and then the brain drain of uh, Judean, Palestinian Jewry towards Babylon. Okay, that was those were the big takeaways that I'm hoping you had from last week. And if not, we've just summarized. Uh, so any questions or thoughts on that before we really change topics and we're going to look at the, the uh, sacred literature of the folks during this time period? Nothing? Okay, good. Uh, hopefully that was a helpful summary. I know I came away last week. There's just so, so much. Uh, during this time period that hopefully that helped. Uh, okay, we are going to talk about the sacred literature of the peoples, uh, the Jewish peoples during this time period. And we are going to hone in on uh, three, three different uh, types of literature. Uh, Midrash, Mishnah, and Gemara. Midrash, Mishnah, and Gemara. Oh, sorry, one other big takeaway from last week uh, as a precursor here. And that is that we see rabbinic Judaism and the rabbinic movement gaining increasing authority during this time period. Uh, and it's not coming primarily internally from Jewish communities. The rabbis become increasingly important, authoritative, powerful uh, even, because in Rome, the Pharisees are the group that was not rebelling. Right? We even saw this within the Jewish literature we looked at in, in the, the Talmud. Uh, and since the Pharisees, since the rabbis were not rebelling, the Romans were willing to vest some level of power with the rabbis. Uh, the word collaborators doesn't seem like a bad word to use here either, probably, though they wouldn't have liked it themselves. Uh, and similarly, within Babylon, within Persia, there was a long tradition of... Uh, having an official hierarchy of relationship with the empire. Uh, that started with the Exilarch, the king in exile, uh, but then increasingly it was the rabbis. This accelerates even more, by the way, when Rome becomes Christian, because all of a sudden they have their way of dealing with Christians and the church, between the priests and the bishops and the so on and so forth, and they are looking for their equivalent in the Jewish community and what they end up with are the rabbis. Uh, so 
We also see the flourishing of rabbinic Judaism during this time period, uh, increasingly being accepted by the people, but really as a trickle-down effect from the fact that the way that these regular Jews would be represented to the authorities was ever increasingly by rabbis. Uh, so again, it's, it's the Romans and the Persians who give power and authenticity to the rabbis, not regular Jews. Uh, okay, did that make sense? That's interesting. Yeah, isn't that interesting how that works? Um, any questions on that before we keep going? Okay, great. Uh, so now we're going to dig into the sacred literature of, I just made my glasses cloudier by cleaning them. Um, now we're going to dig into the sacred literature of these rabbis, and we are going to focus on three genres. And that, that's what these are, are, genres of literature, as well as bodies of literature. We're going to start with the early pair, and then we will uh, uh, move our way through through time and, and space. So the early literatures, in early I mean the rabbis uh, of the first few centuries, the, the rabbis who are still primarily based in Israel, in Judea. These are Midrash, and Mishnah. So Midrash in particular, many of us probably uh, have a sense of, and we're gonna, we're gonna challenge your sense of that here today. Uh, yeah, hopefully that's a theme and story of us, that the ideas you think you know about Jewish life, you come in and we, we explode a little bit. Uh, so we're gonna do that with Midrash. Anyone wanna throw out sort of your definition of Midrash, what you've been taught, how you've understood it? Generally, if people, oh, was, did someone unmute? Please, Larry. Okay, the backstory of the Torah, the in-between spaces. Uh, I'll sometimes uh, call it rabbinic fan fiction of the Bible. Uh, differences of opinion? Differences of opinion, yeah. Annette? Okay. Feeling... So there you go. Exactly. And that is how most of us uh, probably understand Midrash and have been taught Midrash. Uh, and that's what we call Agadic Midrash. Agadah is, means story. In fact, that's where we get the word Haggadah, right? The, the Haggadah for Pesach is our story guide for the Seder. Uh, Agadic just means stories. So most of those that we're thinking of, most of what we think of as Midrash is Agadic Midrashim, those, those stories. Uh, but actually, Midrash and Mishnah, what really differentiates them is their different genres of literature, both of which can have stories and both of which can have legal rulings built into them. Mishnah is organized by topic. There are different orders of the Mishnah. And if you're looking, you want to look something up about blessings or lost objects or a divorce or how to celebrate a holiday or just about anything in life, you can look it up by topic, broad topics in Mishnah. And to call it a well-organized document is a strong statement. Mm -hmm. um, but it at least is organized by topic broadly. Midrash, on the other hand, is exegetical. It is organized by the biblical verse that it is commenting on. So if you've got some great midrash about Abraham that you're trying to remember where it is, Abraham destroying the idols uh, of his father, you can go and look at the Torah portion where Abraham uh, has his first call, Lech Lecha, uh, and maybe it will be there, but maybe actually someone dropped it into a midrash way in Deuteronomy where Abraham's name happens to be mentioned once, and that's where you'll find it. So you can't, you can't really look things up by topic in the same way with Midrash. Did that make sense as just a core distinction between these two things? Okay, the other way I want you to understand Midrash is that fundamentally it's a sermon and that it is often a logic game. One of the things you'll see over and over again in Midrash is uh, there will be a verse from the Torah portion you're dealing with, and then someone will throw out another verse from somewhere else random, or at least it feels random. Song of Songs. 
And then the question will be asked, what do these two verses have in common? And you will get five different midrashim that follow that connect these two verses together. Uh, this is a logic game. This is a whole bunch of people, brilliant people who have spent their lives immersed in this literature. It's the entire, right? They're, they're not, they don't have TVs to watch. They don't have mm -hmm. Star Wars or Star Trek. They don't have movies. They don't, all of, they don't even have a library to go get literature from. This is the literature that they are spending almost all of their time with. Uh, and so these are logic games. You, you get the sense sometimes of them sitting around a table and trying to one-up each other. Oh, you think that's a good connection? Let me show you an even better way to connect these two verses. Uh, and they're written down. Sometimes they really are sermons. I mean, you can feel that this is a sermon. And oftentimes it's really just these games of it all. Did that make sense? We're going to look at a midrash. They didn't think it was games, right? They... Oh, um, Harriet asked, did, did they think it was games? Do you all hear when people are on the table? Yeah. Um, I'm seeing yeses and nos, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, did they think it was a game? Sometimes I think they do, actually. Uh, not a game in a... But an interesting intellectual... Yeah, an intellectual yeah. exercise might be a bit... Um, you know, the way that people sit around a table and debate politics. Right. Mm -hmm. Sort of... How different from the yeshivas, what goes on in the yeshiva now? Hold on, I think I can make some people hear you better. You see, yes, how different from what goes on in the yeshiva now? So, we'll get there. Oh, okay. um, but the short version is that Orthodoxy today is a radically conservative movement that is radically innovative in how conservative it is, R really unlike any other time period of Jewish history. So these early rabbis are not a collection of conservative fundamentalist types. Uh, you certainly get those personalities and those types, but you're also getting radical, the equivalent of radical socialists and leftists and I, the whole range of Jewish politics and way of thinking. And yeah. um, Now, again, this is, and we're going to look at some of these texts that will demonstrate this today, only half the population even has the option of participating in this. And we're looking at these sacred literatures, which are what are saved, and it's only men who have access uh, to certainly what is written down, even if there are women who occasionally have access to studying this literature. It's a literature almost exclusively written by men with male characters, mm -hmm. uh, almost exclusively, not entirely exclusively, uh, but just keeping that in mind, too. But that's what I would say, Nancy, in terms of contemporary yeshivas. Is a yeshiva today is extremely conservative. The yeshivas of this moment are literally engaged in a creative process of writing the Talmud and debating it. So basically, they were creative. The ones today are... Oh, there's still very creative people in the Orthodox world and in the yeshiva but world. But that's not the point of... But it's, a, it's an extremely conservative place, okay. and the creativity is often conservative creativity today. Um, so that's what I would say is, is quite different. Um, okay, let's, any other questions before we actually look at some Midrash? Okay, let's do it. Here we go. Uh, Does that mean there were topics? It was wide open. They could say, what you say interested me, that makes me think of this, and but today it would be more like there are things you couldn't throw into a discussion. Um, hold the question until we get to the orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is a new phenomenon. Okay. Um, okay. So this is showing up for everyone, right? Zoomers, you see this? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Uh, so we're going to go over here uh, and we're going to start. Actually, we're going to start just by looking at a midrash on this week's Torah portion. So... This is Safaria, as always, the wonderful resource. We're going to go over here. Um, 
That did not do what I wanted. That did, though. Uh, okay, so this is the beginning of uh, Tezria Mitsura. Uh, you can be a certified board dermatologist when you are finished studying this. Uh, so we're just looking at the beginning here. We're just going to look at these first two verses. I don't know. I spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelite people. Thus, when a woman at childbirth bears a male, she shall be impure seven days. She shall be impure at the time of her condition of menstrual separation. This is dealing with issues of ritual purity. Just a note on ritual purity. It is not cleanliness, even as it is often translated today as cleanliness. Ritual purity is um, fitness for entering into the temple. So there are conditions that make you unfit for going into the temple that usually are connected with um, the fluids of life. Blood, semen, menstrual fluid, and dead bodies are the main categories that create ritual impurity. Uh, but that just means you are not ready to go into the temple courtyards. It, it's not about cleanliness or uncleanliness, even as that gets translated uh, uh, as the understanding. Okay. So back to our screen share here, uh, because we're really trying to understand Midrash here and not the, not the Torah verses. So I'm just going to go ahead and click over here. This is the beauty of Safari. Uh, we're going to look at all the Midrash. We're actually going to look at the second one down here. How do I make this bigger? Come on, Safari. Did that do it? There we go. Okay. Uh, is there someone? So this is jumping off of uh, uh, those first two verses. Is there someone who'd like to read for us? Someone on Zoom want to read? Can you, can you move them? Are oh. you starting down there when the holy one? Or are you starting when a woman conceives? Uh, when a woman conceives. And I'm sorry for people here. I know it's not, it's putting everyone's faces on top of, uh, on top of it all. I'm not sure I can do anything about that. Okay. Uh, okay, please, whoever was about to read, go ahead. Okay, so hold on. Let's pause for a second. This is the setup. The verse that we're talking about is when a woman conceives. Uh, and the psalm that we're pulling is back in front, you shaped me. These have nothing to do with each other. We have no idea why they're pulling these two. It's just they have pulled two different pieces here. And they're saying, okay, everyone, go. <laughs> so, and then we're going to get the everyone. We're gonna even going to get their names. So go ahead, okay. Samantha. Okay, stop. Hold on, hold on, hold on, stop. That was that was our first midrash, is what we saw here. That's our first attempt. Rabbi Yochanan's first attempt to combine these two verses. And what Rabbi Yochanan's saying is uh, this has to do with how much merit you have. The front and the back is this world and the next world, and the it's some sort of end of days, afterlife, something that he's pushing here. Um, okay. Does that make sense? We don't. We don't need to totally. Yeah. Uh, love his midrash. We're just trying to explore the genre here. Uh, okay, keep going, Samantha. Okay. Pause for a second. Androgynous. Actually, the word in ancient that you find in the Talmud is androgynous. So exact same word we would have today. And it's either indeterminate gender, but it's really sex that the rabbis are talking about here, not gender. Um, it, the meaning is indeterminate genitals or all of the genitals or whatever that looks like here. 
Um, and this is a category of humans that they're dealing with. Okay, keep going. Okay, pause for a second. So this is this is also a classic. Uh, you find this throughout the Mediterranean cultures. This is the soulmate myth, right? That we were created as one soul and split in half and you spend your life Let's going your to soul. find your other half. So you find versions of this everywhere throughout the Mediterranean. You mm -hmm. find it in Plato, you find it in Midrash, you find it um, all over. Uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, if anyone's seen that, you, you, that's all this story right here. Okay, keep going. Okay, so it said they raised an objection. You even get the sense that, who is this? This was Raish Lakish, who used to be a gladiator, by the way, and won his freedom in the rink. Raish Lakish is sitting around there and explaining it this way, and people are not buying it. They say, what are you talking about? It wasn't one being back-to-back. -back. It says it took the rip, okay? Okay. Right, so they, they're challenging him that it's a rib, and what's happening here then is that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is that Rachel Kish responds to them and is using the shoresh, the Hebrew root of these words, and saying that actually this word that you're translating as rib could also mean side. Mm. Did that make sense? Did we follow this? Mm. Okay. Uh, and then it keeps going. We don't have to do all of these. We're going to get all sorts of various responses that are attempts at the same thing. We're getting a lot of Reish Lakish here, but then we're going to get Rabbi Yishmael. And, and all of these different characters are popping up. And you really get this sense that they are sitting around a table debating this. Did that make sense? Yeah, Toby. Yeah, so Toby, we're going to get to Rashi probably in a month or so. Um, but Rashi is living around the year 1000, and we're at the year 400 or so right now. And really, what you can understand Rashi and Maimonides is doing is what they're taking is they're taking Midrash and Mishnah and trying to systematize them and make them accessible instead of having broad collections of things. But that comes later. That's the next step. First, first, the broad collections of things have to be created and broad enough that it becomes a problem that they're inaccessible. So that's coming later. Elliot. Oh, no, you're just unmuted. Great. I'll mute you again. Don't worry. Uh, any other questions about Midrash? Because we are, this is it. That was your Midrash moment. Okay. We're going to look now at Mishnah. Midrash and Mishnah, again, these are the genres of early rabbinic literature, the first 300, 400, 300 or so years of the rabbis. These are the genres of literature. Mishnah, before it becomes the Mishnah, the collection of the sayings of the rabbis edited by Yehuda Hanasi, before we have the Mishnah, we have Mishnayot, we have Mishnahs as a genre and various collections of Mishnahs. Probably Rabbi Meir had a collection of Mishnahs. Rabbi Akiva had collections of Mishnahs. It's very likely that when Rabbi Huda Hanasi collates the Mishnah, that he's working with those other documents uh, as well. In addition, we have something called the Tosafot, which are the B-sides of the Mishnah. Mm -hmm. Like the, the important Mishnayot that don't make the Mishnah end up in the Tosafot. Uh, and then even more so, we have things called Baraitas, uh, Braitot, which end up in the Talmud, which are Mishnahs that uh, aren't written anywhere else. They just are Mishnahs referenced by the Talmud, even though we don't have another document for them. Uh, John. Uh, 
So these literature collections are primarily being written down, edited, constantly revised uh, in the various, what we would now call yeshivas, the academies. Uh, so for the Mishnah, we're dealing with Yehuda Hanasi's yeshiva in the north, Sipori, around the Galilee, Yavne. These are the areas that these documents are being written in. Uh, same with Midrash. They're coming out of the same places from the same people. Uh, and eventually the centers of this work are going to be the academies in Babylon that we talked about last week, uh, in particular Sura, uh, Nahardea, and Pumpadita becomes the major one that we didn't talk about it last week. Uh, Samantha. Great question. Uh, these are elitist academies by and large. Uh, and so you have to have significant education and knowledge even to be a part of these academies and access some of this information. Now it's going to be disseminated. And that's what the rabbis are doing is that they're going and teaching. And that's the origin of the word rabbi, rabbah, arbe, um, to increase, right? To spread knowledge is the idea. Uh, so eventually there are so many midrashim that they start being collected into big documents, into greater collections of midrash. Uh, in fact, our, the most sort of well-known collection of midrash is known as Midrash Rabbah. Uh, and then even the various books get it, Breshit Rabbah, Shmot Rabbah, all these. Um, and Rabbah just means big. Like rabbi. Like, like, like rabbi, yeah, yeah. But the whole idea is it's just like, the big book of Midrash, and it's that collection. But we found Midrashim that have since entered into the Midrashic conversation in the Cairo Geniza. We have, there's all sorts of these other collections, of to Rabbi Natan, and um, just all sorts of other collections of Midrashim that have been found through the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and generally integrated into Jewish conversation once they are found. Uh, okay, any other questions on that? Today, they're very searchable through Safari. Yeah. Marilyn, yeah. You know, what I would say is I, I think we need to separate out the purpose of the literature once it becomes literature from the purpose of the original conversations. These collections of literature are the collections of how this fledgling movement of Judaism that is growing in political and cultural importance, it, this is how it speaks and how it passes on its ideas. Uh, a lot of these midrashim that we have are stories that have been taught. Oh, here's this Midrash that Rabbi Yochanan, my teacher of a blessed memory, used to teach about how to understand this text. And so you really, some of it's how we use it today too, uh, where Midrash is going to be very focused on the weekly Torah portion. It becomes a part of how to understand this text Jewishly. When I'm getting ready to read the Torah, if I'm reading the Torah on Shabbat morning, I sit down and I read first the Torah itself, uh, and make sure that I can translate it uh, and understand the vocabulary. Then I read Rashi, which is really just an overview of rabbinic thought on this, Mishnah and primarily Midrash on this section. And then anything that's interesting, I will dig into individual Midrashi. Right? Rashi is sort of the summary. Rashi is the Cliff Notes version of <laughs> Midrash. Uh, because a lot of these Midrashim are not particularly interesting or relevant or... Um, but this is rabbinic exegesis. The, this is the early movement of the rabbis trying to understand and explain their sacred documents and preserve their understandings and explanations. Did that help, Marilyn? Marion.
That was a story. That was a Gothic Midrash. But you will find Midrashim that ultimately are not about telling a story, but are about explaining how to keep kosher during Passover. But the key to Midrash is that it is organized by biblical verse. So most of the time that we are dealing with Midrash, particularly as Reformed Jews, we're dealing with agotic Midrashim stories because we're generally just not that super interested in Jewish law. In the places that we are interested in Jewish law, we're not interested in historical Jewish law. We're interested in practical Jewish law, right? By and large, if you have a question about keeping kosher during Passover, you don't care about the Midrashic origins of it. You just know that like you need to do something with this plate or this knife or this, whatever it is. And what do we do about it? Um, so those aren't the Midrashim that we spend time on generally. Uh, they're not the ones that are. Okay. That's a, hold on. Let me, let me pause you there because that's a, that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. So the, you're referencing the oven of Achnai, right? So the oven of Achnai, if you've never studied it, it's this great, great text of moving walls and how God doesn't get a vote and what Jewish law looks like. And it's this wild, awesome story. The oven of Achnai is not a midrash. And that, so, so I'm really glad that you referenced it um, because this is the problem. We tend to use the word midrash to describe stories. But that's not Midrash as a genre. Midrash as a genre is about it being organized by biblical verse. That story of the Oven of Achnai is in the Gemara. It's in the Talmud. So it is not, in fact, Midrashic. It's not a Midrash. That's not how it's organized. It's just in the Talmud. Uh, however, it feels like a Midrash because we think of Midrash as stories rather than as an organizational system. Uh, and so... Bruria and Rabbi Meir. That's in Ezra Driven Leaf. Huh? That's in Ezra Driven Leaf. Um, there's also a wonderful, uh, uh, well, hold on, I'll go to that next. Um, that is split between sections in the Gemara and the Midrash. And some of these characters show up in both. I believe Bruria is mostly in the Talmud, though, not in the Midrash. Uh, ex <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. A lot of your favorite agotic stories that feel like what you imagine Midrash to be aren't from the Midrashic material. They're from the Gemara, which is a split off of the Mishnaic material. Uh, but again, that's just the organizational scheme. And that's the issue here is we tend to use the word Midrash to describe uh, stories. But in a technical sense, Midrash is how things are organized. Um, midrash are like novels and Mishnah is like an encyclopedia don't push too hard on that um, but they're different genres of literature um, yeah I know I just made it more confusing I see that yeah Susan go ahead Okay, this is great. So I think, well, welcome to Jewish life. Um, so you've honed in on another important distinction between halachic midrash and agotic midrash. Halachic midrash that is about how you behave. Halacha, remember, is not just keeping kosher. It's also 
criminal law and tort law and personal injury and lost items and anything you can imagine is in halakha, divorce, marriage, friendship. Um, but if it's halachic, you have to have an answer. And so there are Jewish legal codes that arise after the Midrashic moment to resolve the differences in halakha, in Jewish, in apparent Jewish law between various sources. And those codes are pulling from Mishnah and Midrash and trying to resolve it into one behavior, right? In the end, you can either go left or right at a fork. You can't, can't do both actions at a fork in the road. A Gothic Midrash, on the other hand, the stories, there is a principle that they exist in their own universe and they never need to be um, coherent between each other. Each Midrash lives on its own and contains its own truth. And it there's not one answer. You can have a Midrash that says, well, Abraham got to the fork in the road and went left. Mm -hmm. And the next Midrash says, Abraham got to the fork in, ro in the road and went right. And there isn't a question of which direction did Abraham go in. There's the world that exists when Abraham went left and the world that exists when Abraham went right. Because... It's not history. Mm -hmm. it's is, that, is that the basis for you could look at it this way or you could look at it this way? Yeah, Maybe sure. This? Exactly. So when it has halachic implications, when it has legal ruling implications, you have to have an answer. When it doesn't, it exists right in its own world. Um, but Rabbi Susan loves to quote this midrash. This is a beautiful midrash. That as Abraham is over Isaac, ready to murder Isaac, that there is an earthquake that causes the ground to shake and his hand drops the knife. What caused the earthquake? It was the marching of our feet as we escaped Yitziat Mitzrayim, as we left from Egypt and were making our way towards freedom. Hundreds and hundreds of years later, right? Like, but these, the footsteps sent, sent reverberations through time and through space in a beautiful midrash, right? Gorgeous. Are you supposed to believe it? Yeah, you're absolutely supposed to believe it. Literally, absolutely not. And no one is asking it to be believed literally. Um, this, I, we sound like the 2016 election. You're not supposed to believe it literally, but you are supposed to take it seriously. Uh, and that, that's the idea here with these is that they exist in their own bubble universes. Um, did, was that helpful? This, by the way, writ large is why many contemporary scholars of theology, not theologians, but people who study about theologians and theology, say that there's no such thing as Jewish theology. Because theology is coherent and is an attempt to create a coherent narrative. And Judaism never attempts to create a coherent narrative. There is the theology that exists inside this midrash, which is radically different than the theology that exists over here. The nature of God can be radically different in two different midrashim next to each other. And that's just how it is. There's no attempt or even desire, I would say, to create one answer so on those questions. Is this where Pilpo comes from? Yeah. Yeah. All of these approaches okay. emerge from this, this rabbinic project. Uh, okay. Other questions here. Okay, let's go ahead and look at Mishnah now. Uh, so that was Midrash, right? Do we have some, oh, and that was at a hand, I'm sorry. No, maybe not. If, if that was you trying to say something, Annette, go ahead and unmute yourself, but if not, don't worry about it. Um, okay, so that's Midrash, the genre of Midrash, exegetical commentary on the Torah and beyond the Torah. There's Midrash on all sorts of other texts too in the Hebrew Bible. Now we're looking at Mishnah. Mishnah, we're looking at the Mishnah, in fact, and the Mishnah arises uh, as a response to the Roman destructions. This is the document that Yehuda Hanasi puts together in his uh, yeshiva in the north of Israel. And this is where all of those scholars that we looked at last week are learning and then taking those teachings and this document back to Babylon with them. So here are the orders of um, the Mishnah, just looking at some of these topics quickly so you get a sense of the, really, the, the 
breadth of topics. There's brachot, which is probably the most commonly studied one. This is on prayer, focusing on Shema and Amidah. There's uh, peya, about uh, tzedakah, basically. It's about agricultural justice uh, and economic justice. Uh, the requirements of donating to priests, the seven-year cycle of Shemitah, uh, separating out dough and making challah kosher, the laws of the first fruits, how Shabbat works, how uh, the donations to the temple works, how the various holidays work, Yom Az, Yom Kippur, Sukkah, Rosh Hashanah, uh, what, how special foods are made, what, what labor is permitted on holidays, uh, prayers in the time of drought and rain, Esther in the scroll, uh, how to deal with Passover and the intermediate days of Passover and the laws of widows and marriage contracts and uh, what to do if someone's accused of adultery and divorce and how marriage works and the laws of it and lost property and uh, you can go on and on and on, right? The, the point being here that it's an endless list that if there's a way that humans live, it is attempted to be covered in its Jewish anthologized form in the Mishnah. So we are going to look at a book of the Mishnah that is um, maybe the most exceptional book of the Mishnah, meaning that it just doesn't feel like the other ones. Uh, but we're going to look at it anyways because... Uh, where did it go? Well, I've gone too far. Uh because it tells us something about the rabbinic movement and it's maybe the most famous book of Mishnah. There it is. Pirkei Avot. Oh. So in fact, Pirkei Avot is well known enough that lots of people have heard of Pirkei Avot and have no clue that it is a part of the Mishnah at all. Uh, but it is a book of the Mishnah. It does not have a book in the follow-up text of the Gemara. Don't worry if that didn't mean anything to you. We will cover that in coming weeks. Uh, but let's just go ahead and start here. Will someone read this very first verse of Pirkei Avot? In fact, the, let's not call it a verse. This very first Mishnah of Pirkei Avot. And a Mishnah is a verse of the Mishnah. Please. Okay, pause. So, is that the same Hebrew? That's the same. Generally thought to be the Sanhedrin. Here, the if you look at the Hebrew, it says Knesset Hagdola. It's literally the Great Assembly, uh, which are the rabbis at this point. Ah, okay. So, what did we just read there? The passing down, passing of the Torah. Of the, this is why you're supposed to care about their opinion. This is the articulation of rabbinic authority and authenticity. Where do the rabbis get all of these wacky teachings that they are throwing out there? They get it because God gave it to Moses at Sinai and Moses taught it to Joshua and Joshua to the elders and the elders to the prophets and the prophets to the rabbis. And that's why you should listen to what we're saying. That's the argument right there. Uh, and this is really the only place we get this. Right? The, the whole notion of the oral Torah and its authenticity and its legitimacy, this is where we get that articulation, right here in Pirkei Avot. The rabbinic tradition should be followed because it can be directly traced back to Mount Sinai with Moses. Number one is big page That's what we're talking about. We are talking about the we're talking about the Mishnah here. The rabbis are talking about their own documents of work, uh, and so much of what we're seeing in in the Mishnah and in the Talmud is the rabbinic attempt to show why they and their movement are legitimate, and that's what we're saying here. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, let's keep going.
Okay, so we, we can look at the three things here, and, and you'll see as we go on, we'll do a few more verses. You, you, we're going to get a collection of, and so-and-so said three things, and the other person said three things. And, and you can really see how these were mnemonics that, that then got listed together here. But there's something pretty radical happening. Moses received the Torah at Sinai. And what is that Torah? Immediately, they said three things. Be patient in justice, raise many disciples, make offense around the Torah. Uh, they are immediately connecting their teaching to what Moses received at Sinai. This is exactly your point, Paul, that, uh, you know, we, are we dealing with the written Torah? If we are, what we would expect is that th we would then see a quote from the Torah. And we're not. We're instead seeing a rabbinic quote. So this is a legitimation of the oral Torah, which is the rabbinic project. And it begins right here in Pure Kavod. Exactly. 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 And the whole telephone idea uh, that you find particularly emphasized in the Orthodox world Right, that every generation can be trusted less because they are further from the original telephone at Mount Sinai comes from here. And this is this is really where that notion arises from. Uh, okay, let's do a few more just to get a flavor here. Okay, this is, first of all, he's got a great name, Shimon Hatzadik, right? Mm -hmm. Simon the Righteous. Um, but we already are seeing the nostalgic look here. Uh, this is clearly being written in a time where the Great Assembly is no more. It has been destroyed. And so we are getting the attempt to conserve the sayings of the great ones who came before. Not like the schlubs who live today, but the great ones of previous generations. And we still do this. We all still do this phenomenon. Um, and that's what they're doing uh, at this moment right here. Uh, and we get the three particular things that, that he's suggesting. And uh, let's keep going just to keep getting a little more of the flavor. Go ahead. A classic Jewish name right there, right? Um, but it is a classic Jewish name because it's a Greek Jewish name. <laughs> well, we can change it. It's not too late. It's... Just call him anti. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so right, we're already getting a generation past. Okay, we can all agree that we should listen to the men of the Great Assembly, but, you know... You're not, you're no Shimon the Righteous. You're not on the Great Assembly. So now we're getting that generational movement of creating the legitimacy to the project that's happening right there and then. Okay. Um, again, we we're gonna we can get into the specific theologies here, and and Pure Kavod is a really interesting text to study and a classic text to study. Particularly, uh, a lot of people do it from Pesach to Shavuos. Uh, that that you study all of Pure Kavod. Uh, you can divide it up a chapter a week and things like that. Um, but yeah, so. So I was clearly way too optimistic about what we were going to cover today because I had the Talmud coming next under today's curriculum. So it is going to be next week instead. Um, but the short answer to that, Toby, is that this is all the literature. What we've looked at today is the literature of ancient rabbinic Israel. The Israel, Palestine, Judea, whatever words we're putting there, and it changes during this time, from about the year zero to the year 200. 250. 
That's what we're talking about here. The next layer is what happens when this comes to Babylon and when Babylon becomes the center. And in the academies of Babylon, there is an attempt to explain the Mishnah. And that is the Gemara. In fact, actually, they I saw it in the way that they wrote it here. I thought it was great. Talmud. Generations of rabbinic debate about laws, ethics, and Bible structured as a commentary on the Mishnah with stories interwoven. This is from Safaria that I'm reading it there. But I, I thought that was really a great encapsulation of the Talmud. Um, so the Talmud is structured as a commentary on the Mishnah. But... That's only in the broadest of senses that so it becomes the Talmud that. that has the text in the middle. Right now. That's the Talmud. We'll get there. Yep. Um, that'll be next week, I think. Uh, actually, no, that's not true. We're going to do something different next week. Next week, we're going to do a Pesach spectacular. Uh, no, hold on. Do we have two Tuesdays before Pesach? Just one. Just one. Next week will be a Pesach. We'll, we'll go back in time and we'll talk the Pesach story and things like that and uh, connect the Haggadah to all this. Um, and then we'll be back to our regular programming. Uh, Marilyn. I, I said Marilyn, but go ahead, Leon, and then we'll get to Marilyn next. What do you mean by standard? To say another word. Ah, uh, got it. Yes, 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 yes. So there are multiple collections of Mishnayot, and it's really Yehuda Hanasi around the year 200 who creates the version of the Mishnah. And then it is passed around. And there is, if what you're asking is, are, are there differences in versions of Yehuda Hanasi's Mishnah, um, that's a level of scholarship on ancient texts that I just don't know about the Mishnah. Good question, though. Um, no, right, in the, are there multiple codexes and variants and traditions that come from the, certainly that ends up being true of the Talmud. Um, Marilyn. You know, I think particularly, particularly in um, Mishnah, I think you're going to see that in early Midrash. And that's because it's literally the same people who are doing this. Uh, right? Jesus and his followers are hanging out with these people because they are these people to a large extent. There are there are divisions that would have been important to them in terms of the politics of their moment that would have helped to separate them into their various groups. But I think backing away writ large, ignoring what comes next in terms of, you know, Judaism a thousand years later and, and Christianity writ large, these are the same people having the same conversations, right? Jesus and his followers are some of these folks sitting around these tables having these arguments. Um, Yeah, exactly. And even just how to speak in parables and how to construct this, right? There, there are just some core literature pieces that have nothing to do with ethics and everything to do just with local culture that we see um, coming through here. Uh, um, okay, any other last questions? Uh, just to be clear, I'm reading the chat Josiah wrote. Uh, just to be clear, none of us uh, here fall for the fallacy that greatness only existed in previous generations. Oh, very sweet. He's, he's talking about CRC rabbis. Very sweet, Josiah. Um, okay. Any last thoughts? Any? Elliot. The CRC YouTube page? 
No, something, I don't know what that is, but I'll take a look at it. No, because we, we're streaming this right now to YouTube. Yep, I, is that, a, it should be up there. That's it. That's a different text. That's I can find, uh, send me a message, text me and I'll, or, or email me and I will get you that link. Thank you. Okay. Good to be with everyone. Great. See y'all soon.